uh, for questions. And um, I realized that the speaker of our first paper is already with us, um, Yujuku Murase. So um, if you wish, you could start with your paper on five rules for friendly rivalry in iterated prisoners dilemmas. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Yosuke Murase. Uh, I'm going to share my uh, video. Uh, I cannot share my screen because host disabled screen sharing. So, ah, okay, now I can share my screen. Hello, everyone. I'm Yosuke Murase from Likan. Today, I'm going to give a talk on our finding on the highly effective strategies for the iterated prisoner's dilemma. This is a joint work with Professor Sun ki from Pukyong National University. Prisoner's dilemma is the most fundamental mathematical framework to describe the social dilemma, where players are tempted to take selfish actions while such selfish actions are bad for the entire society. The payoff matrix of prisoner's dilemma is given like this. If the players play the game only once, the only rational action is defection because a player always obtains a higher payoff by defecting. However, the cooperative behavior can arise when the game is repeated because the players have a strate strategic option that they can reward the cooperator in future. Many kinds of strategies have been studied for this game. The most well-known would be tit for tat, which is the winning strategy of the Axel Road tournament. With this strategy, the player can cooperate when the co-player is generous, and the player can defend herself when she was cheated. It is guaranteed that your long-term payoff is no less than the co-players. However, Tit for tat is a fragile against the noise. When two tit for tat players play the game, and one of them happens to defect by mistake, then they are trapped into continuous retaliations. Another well known strategy is win stay lose shift. With this strategy, the cooperation is tolerant against an error. They can recover cooperation from erroneous defections. On the other hand, a critical downside of this strategy is a weakness against defectors. If the strategy is known to your co-player, he can repeatedly exploit you just by keeping defections. According to a recent understanding, well-known strategies are classified into two types of groups, partners or rivals. This is a schematic diagram of strategy space in this figure, cooperative strategies are placed on the left side, while the stringent strategies are placed on the right side. Partners are a class of strategies indicated by the blue area, which can form mutual cooperation even under the noise. For instance, Winstead Rule Shift and Generous Kit Water belong to this class. On the other hand, rivals are a class of strategies that are stringent against the co which is represented by the red circle in this figure. If a strategy is a rival, it is guaranteed that your long-term payoff never becomes less than the others. For instance, tit for tat and extortionate zero determinant strategies belong to this class. Since each of partners and rivals has pros and cons, it would be great if a single strategy satisfies these advantages simultaneously. We call such a class of strategies friendly rivals, which are shown as, a, as the overlap of these two classes in this figure. It is not easy to be a friendly rival because you must forgive your co player's erroneous defection to be a partner, and at the same time, you must punish your co player's malicious defection to be a rival without knowing his intention. This is the crux of the matter in relationships. More concretely speaking, rivals and partners are defined as follows. When a strategy is a rival, 
the long-term payoff never becomes less, uh, less than the co-players payoff. This inequality must be true even when the co-players are very smart, having a long memory, and even when your strategy is known to the public. We can check if the strategy is a rival or not by investigating the graph property of the state transitions. On the other hand, if the strategy is a partner, the players can maintain cooperation even under the noise when both players use the same strategy. Namely, the probability to form cooperation reaches 1 as error rate tends to 0. A friendly rival strategy forms a cooperative Nash equilibrium. This is because when a player A is a rival, the payoffs of each player is confined to this shaded, shaded triangle. Therefore, player B's best action is to take the same strategy as A and realize mutual cooperation, indicated by this blue dot. To find friendly rivals, we conducted a massive computation using a supercomputer. We comprehensively enumerated all memory 1, memory 2, and memory 3 strategies. Here, memory M means that the action is prescribed based on the history over the last M rounds. The enumeration is quite challenging because the number of possible strategies expands super quickly, like exponential over exponential. We completed this calculation by developing algorithms and using a supercomputer. As a result, we found that there is no friendly rival in memory 1 space. In memory 2 strategy space, there are only four solutions. However, in memory 3 strategies, we found 4 trillion friendly rival strategies. Although its fraction is qu it's quite tiny, there are indeed many types of friendly rival strategies. Using these friendly rivals, it is indeed possible to achieve mutual cooperation while defending oneself from malicious defectors. Most of the found friendly rivals are complicated, and it is not straightforward to interpret how they are working. Here we picked up two friendly rivals randomly and depicted their state to state transitions. As you can see, there are many internal states and they are not easy to understand. However, we found one friendly rival which is easy to interpret. We named it Capri after five simple rules that describe the behavior. The first rule is cooperate at mutual cooperation. When you are cooperating with your co-player, keep cooperation. The second rule is accept punishment. When you mistakenly defected from mutual cooperation, accept punishment from your co-player in the next round and then recover cooperation. The third rule is about punishment. Punish your co-player by defecting once when he defected from mutual cooperation and then recover cooperation when he accepted punishment. The fourth rule is recover cooperation. Uh, when the co-player cooperated at mutual defecti defection, you should switch your action to cooperation as well. The final rule is in all the other cases, defect. In other words, a defection is a default action. For instance, Capri keeps defecting when the co-player is defecting as well. Capri is similar to Grim Trigger rather than Tit for Tat. Grim Trigger is a strategy which cooperates in the first round and continues cooperation as long as co player is cooperating. Once its co player defected, it changes it, its action to defection and never cooperate. The first and fifth rules of Capri is nothing but Grim Trigger. However, Capri is different from Grim Trigger in two ways. First, it is error tolerant. Even if one of the players mistakenly defected, they can maintain cooperation. The second notable difference from Grim Trigger is its ability to escape from mutual defection. While Grim Trigger is irreversible, 
couple you can recover cooperation because of the fourth rule. Finally, I'm gonna show you the result of the evolutionary game. Although a rival strategy assures that the player is never outperformed by the co-player, it does not necessarily guarantee a success in evolutionary games where everyone is pitted against every other in the population. According to recent understanding, evolutionary success of a strategy depends on the environmental conditions such as the population size and the ratio of the benefit to cost of cooperation. This figure shows the abundance of partner, rival, and other strategies when species are memory one strategies. Rivals are successful when the benefit to cost ratio is low or the population size is small, whereas partners get abundant in the other cases. When we introduce Capri into this system, the result changes drastically. As you see in this figure, Capri overwhelms the other species for the entire parameter range. Since Capri has advantages of both partners and rivals, it is highly advantageous in evolutionary settings. Actually, we analytically showed that when rivals are evolutionarily robust for any population size, benefit to cost ratio, and selection strength, which explains why Capri is so successful. To conclude, we found a diverse patterns of friendly rivals in memory three strategy space by massive computation using a supercomputer. Among them, we found a simple strategy, Capri, that is described by five simple rules. In various respects, we would say this is one of the best strategies ever because cooperation is robust against error, it never allows any co-player to beat you, and it is evolutionally robust. If you get interested in the details, please check our paper. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's have a look whether there are questions. So at the moment, um, there is no question in the chat. Um, Markus Krellner, he has a question. May you switch on your microphone? Or is it just, oh, it's a hand clapping. Okay, uh, just a question from my side. Um, do you uh, have, uh, or do you think that it would be an idea to combine your research with uh, experimental research, with behavioral experiments? Could it be interesting? Yes, it could be interesting. And we consider uh, Capri is kind of similar to uh, behavioral experiments uh, conducted in the past. So uh, in experiment, so human, human beings co uh, conducted plays, uh, iterated prisoner dilemma. And uh, according to uh, previous research, uh, people decide whether he or she cooperate or not, depending on the, the uh, past number of defections of both players. So which behaves a kind of similar to Capri. So, and because Capri is so successful in evolutionary games, so that's why uh, it is similar to our kind of intention, because our intention uh, is shaped by evolutionary process. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there's a question by Eladio Monteo. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. I'm, I'm just curious first uh, if you if you uh, modeled this uh, simulation with other payoff matrices. Like uh, in here, I can see that you that you define a, a, a payoff matrix that is the classical prisoner dilemma. But I wonder if if you tried this uh, strategy with other matrices that may be uh, incentive cooperation. That, that's a great question. So actually, uh, it works not only for prisoner's dilemma, but also for other social dilemma like stag hand game mm -hmm. or snow drift game. Mm 
Okay, okay. So thank great. you for a great question. Uh, and also, I'm I'm curious of how how long does it take to compute all the, all those um, scenarios <laughs> in this uh, computer? Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah, actually, it takes about uh, six hours using uh, thousand of CPUs. All right. All right. Well, so, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, giving the schedule, uh, we have to switch to the second paper. Thank you again. I realized. Um, thank you very much. Francesco Bertolotti, in, thank you. Um, so um, I would like to hand over to you. Okay, thank you. I, I will share the screen. So. Can you see it? Yes, I see. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity of presenting here. And uh, today I will uh, talk to you about the about a research that I developed with Professor Angelo Cora and Professor Luca Mari related to the mechanism that. Uh, List the emergence of risk sensitivity in the complex reactive systems. In the, this specific model, the textbook uh, uh, system that we chose to analyze uh, is a prey predator agent based model. Uh, risk sensitivity, which is a term that includes uh, risk awareness and, uh, um, and risk seeking, is a multidisciplinary topic. And it it can be found in economics uh, as well as in psychology and biology. And in all these, uh, all these fields, uh, the, there is a backbone, which is that individuals take decisions characterized by a different level of caution under condition of uncertainty. And this was where the emergence of this phenomenon is what uh, we studied in this research, especially how this emerges from a, an evolutionary perspective. Uh, there is uh, we found out that uh, it's kind of, there is some nudity in this work uh, since there is uh, not a lot of studies, there's still a gap in uh, understanding the um, evolutionary emergence of uh, risk immersion and especially risk seeking. And uh, as well as in the best of our knowledge, there is, uh, seems to be a gap uh, in, the, um, uh, in the study of this phenomena on a prey predator model. Least but not last, uh, uh, we want uh, also to check the environmental effect on uh, these uh, death, uh, the environment variables, as uh, on the emergence of a risk version. The model is kind of a simple model and uh, is uh, based by, is a model which two kinds of uh, agents move and perform in, uh, on a two dimensional toroidal surface prey and predators. The prey, which are the most important uh, agents, also the target population which the emergence of risk sensitivity is uh, analyzed, is, uh, can perform two actions. They can eat to an energy source or run away from a predator. The, in the same way, they can die in two ways. So they can run out of energy since they consume a, a fixed amount of energy at each time and they can source energy when they eat and when they found an energy source on this two dimensional surface and so collect from it or they can be reached by a predator and so be hunted and die in that way. They have limited information available in the way in which uh, they can see only in a, a limited vision ray and uh, they have no memory. This is because we wanted to focus on the evolutionary process and uh, not on learning. So we thought that it would be best to maintain uh, the model as simple as possible. And when uh, it's up to taking a decision for the prey, they can be in, uh, for a prey can be in one of four scenarios. It can uh, have, uh, it can see uh, energy source. I can see no energy source and no predator and so move randomly. It can see a predator and so, move in the opposite direction. 
he can see uh, an energy source and so hid in that direction, or he can see both an energy source and uh, a predator. In that case, what the prey is doing is uh, taking a decision, computing an utility function, which the two variables are the distances between, uh, between it itself and the predator, so the threat, and the energy source, so the possible gain. These, uh, these two variables are weighting, uh, weighted using uh, two genes, which one stands for the risk aversion and the other stands for the risk seeking. And uh, in this way, computing the utility, it decides what decision to take. These genes can be transmitted to the offspring by sexual reproduction. And uh, also prey can escape to predators uh, just looking at themselves so individually or by uh, using a kind of a coordination strategy. So coordinating with the other prey in order to not run away altogether. On the other side, predators are much simpler um, agents. They can uh, perform only one action. They hit to the nearest prey. They cannot die, they are perpetual. They need no energy to survive. And in the same way of prey, they have limited information available and no memory. This model was actually implemented on uh, NetLogo. And on this implementation, it was, uh, out of this implementation, it was a sensitivity analysis was performed were more than 100,000 simulations. And uh, using the support of Behavior Space, a tool on uh, NetLogo. And uh, so the results that uh, I, will I will show you are taken from the simulation data. At first, uh, it were, at first we realized that uh, the risk sensitivity, which is the difference between risk aversion and the risk aversion gene and the risk uh, seeking gene from the population in, in the population for each simulation is, uh, is uh, influenced by some environmental factors. Uh, for example, in this case, the pace of the predator, so how fast is the predator, which is kind of, uh, uh, can be one of the proxy of how dangerous is the environment, uh, seems to have a relationship with uh, the risk sensitivity. The fastest is this, uh, the more risk uh, seeking become the population. So we thought that it could be interesting to define a dangerousness uh, metric of the system. In order to do this, we develop a Bayesian network and using the gene, and we perform a partially supervised learning to take into consideration the knowledge we already had since we build the model. So the input has to be input and the output has to be output. But for the rest, we let the, the algorithm to do it uh, by itself. And uh, on this network, we perform a random control trial. In this way, we actually we are trying to assess the effect of the environmental variables on the percentage of survival. It means that that is a metric that detects for a certain how, how many that detects how what is the number the percentage of the simulations in which the population of prey survive until the end of the simulation, and is a proxy to say if. Uh, higher percent, lower percent of survives, it means that the environment can be more or less dangerous. Out of this, we're able to build a dangerousness metric. And uh, we plotted with the risk sensitivity. We found out actually that there is a non-monotonic relationship between the risk sensitivity and the dangerousness of the environment, as well as the risk adverse behaviors emerge in the population only for lower values of dangerousness. What is more, we control, we, uh, control the relationship between the risk sensitivity and the coordination, which is identified by a, a variable named separation ray. And also in this case, we found out a negative relationship 
between a separation, uh, in this case, we found out a negative relationship between uh, say, risk sensitivity and uh, the level of coordination. So the more the more uh, the more uh, the prey population is able to coordinate, the the more risk seeking they become. So let's discuss these uh, results. The first point that we found out is uh, that uh, risk sensitivity actually emerges in uh, in uh, this prey predator model, which since it was kind of simple, we think that it's possible to generalize it. And uh, this is, uh, of course, emerge, and so it merges risk aversion and risk seeking. The second uh, point that we find out is the effect of environment. Uh, especially the fact that there is this non-monotonic relationship between risk sensitivity and uh, the dangerousness of the environment. What does it mean? It's kind of uh, thinking about it, there is uh, a developing a risk, uh, a risk aversion. It means uh, losing opportunities or taking energy. For this reason, it is, uh, for this reason, actually, it is uh, interesting that in situation in which uh, the, the environment is extremely dangerous, there is no incentive in developing uh, risk sensitivity, uh, risk uh, aversion, and the prey became risk seeking. On the other time, or on the other side, when the environment is not dangerous at all, as well, there is no incentive to develop a strong risk awareness because uh, a prey will lose an opportunity to gain energy without uh, no gain back. So without uh, having a, a kind of, a, without surviving more uh, with more, more likely. The last point is the relationship between the sensitivity and the coordination. And uh, it can possible to say that if uh, in a collective way, so the preys together are able to face the problem in a collective way, they do not need to develop a risk, risk aversion. And on the other side, they can be more risk seeking because they have better skills in running away. And so they can manage better the, the danger. And this brings us to the conclusion, which are basically what we just discussed. Risk sensitive first, risk sensitivity can emerge in prey predator systems. Second, environment factors have no linear effect on the emergence of risk sensitivity. And third, there is a relationship between the prey skills and the direction of the risk sensitivity. They can become, the more they are skilled and the more they're able to face the danger, the more they become risk seeking. And uh, we have some future develop in our minds. At first, uh, the, to test these results with a dynamic environment to see if there is some, uh, if uh, something will change, maybe if we find out something interesting about it, to test it with the more sophisticated coordination strategies, to find out the if there is a, it could, could be a coemergence of risk sensitivity behaviors and cooperation. And uh, as well as we can find out a coemergence between the, the risk sensitivity behavior in the prey population and in the predator population. And uh, at, the, at the end, to test these results on a different set of complex selective systems to see if they are, uh, if they are specific or if it is possible to find out some more general role. And, uh, Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your interesting presentations. Um, so are there any questions? Let me have a look on the chat. At the moment in the chat, there is no question, but maybe a question uh, from um, my side. Could you uh, tell us something about uh, how you, um, uh, about your understanding of coordination or how, how the coordination takes place in, in your model. Let's, let's put it this way. Okay, the, the coordination in the model is a kind of primitive one. The, there's, uh, in the graphic, uh, there was on the, on the X axis, uh, it is possible to see there was different uh, shades because we'll study on different level. 
what how the, the praise population and the praise coordinate is uh, to not run away just directly from the nearest predator, but running away, taking in consideration that if there is other prey beside, split the direction. And so try to co spatially coordinate in order to, in order to avoid the chance to be ca both caught. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Let's have a look in the chat. So, so at the moment, uh, there is no question. Maybe afterwards, or uh, well, so we could uh, um, step further to our third paper. I realized that the first author, uh, Bianca Ogbo, is uh, already uh, with us. I'm not sure whether you will give the presentation. Bianca? Yeah, hello. Hello, hello. So um, if you wish, you could start. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Yeah. Can you see my screen now, just to confirm? Yes, I see your screen. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ndidi Bianca Obo. Um, our paper today is co-authored by Dr. Ayman and Dr. Diane, who is my supervisor. Um, I'm a PhD student in Seaside University. Um, our paper is on evaluation of coordination in pairwise and multiplayer interaction via parallel commitments. Okay, so um, in the past, there has been so many research on solving coordination and, co and cooperation problems faced in evaluation of um, biology, economics, computer science. Um, the problem is that how group of individuals can be coordinated together how they can come together with different motives to achieve a common goal. And um, that is what uh, we are trying to achieve in, in our research work. We're looking at the competitive market, which is, uh, we looked at technology adoption market. So we're looking at how, um, mm -hmm. how people can be coordinated, group of individuals can be, co can, can be coordinated to adopt a technology. So for this, we are going, we're using an evaluational game theory to achieve this, building mathematical models that will illustrate decision-making among firms that are to coordinate themselves and make a decision on technology adoption. And of course, we, we know EGT allows us to understand the um, cooperative behaviors, gives us analytical tools to, to explain evaluation of cooperation. Um, example is the prisoner dilemma and the public goods game. Um, I'm sure we are familiar with the prisoner dilemma where if, um, if the two parties, they both uh, stay silent, they have a lesser stay in the prison. Um, if one stays silent, the other betrays. The one that stays silent um, gets three years and the other gets, um, goes free. And same like the public goods game where um, they are to contribute to a public fund, but of course, some of them want to outsmart the others in the, in the group. So our, our own um, problem we are trying to solve is more of the coordination problems, how we can coordinate um, firms, coordinate group of individuals to, to achieve a common goal by coordinating their activities. Because uh, if they coordinate among themselves, it, it would be more beneficial for them um, to achieve a common goal than them doing their own thing. Uh, so that's what we're trying to achieve in our research work. Um, we looked at technology adoption and um, where there's either a high technology to adopt or a low technology to adopt. And uh, we, we, we looked at either two firms come together to achieve this, either adopt a high technology or a low technology. Or we also looked at um, more firms, more than two firms coming together to adopt a technology. And um, if they adopt a technology, a low technology will lead to a low benefit, a high technology will lead to a high benefit. So how can these firms agree within themselves to either go for a low technology when you know if you go for a low technology, you will get a low benefit, but if you go for the higher one, you will get a higher benefit. 
Of course, all the individuals will want to go for the high technology, but we're looking at a case where we can coordinate them that some of them can either you know, um, adopt the low technology and the others adopt the high technology. And at the end of the day, um, they, are, they, are, they have the same incentives. They are not, um, no one is cheated. So we looked at um, having a pre-agreement, a prior commitment if we, if we implement um, these players coming together and uh, one of the players, we ask the other player to adopt a different technology and the one that asks um, co-player to adopt a different technology pays like an agreement fee, like a cost of adopting that particular technology. And then when um, the other player, for instance, um, FEM A asks FEM B to adopt a low technology and FEM A is adopting a high technology. So when FEM A, uh, FEM B agrees, FEM A will pay for the cost of agreement. And then uh, FEM B, of course, we adopt the low technology and when FEM A gets the benefit of a high technology, FEM A will have to share um, the profit of adopting a high technology to FEM B that agrees to adopt a low technology. And then if it's a case whereby uh, FEM B fails the agreement deal, uh, FEM B is going to pay like a compensation cost to FEM A that initiated that deal. Uh, so we, we had this uh, prior commitment that binds them to coordinate um, this group of firms to um, agree and come together to achieve um, the common goal of adopting a particular technology. And we looked at this uh, in both peer-wise, just two players, and then we looked at it also in a case of multi-players when there are more than two players um, in the group composition. And we could see that like the HPs, which are the uh, commitment proposing strategies, they compensate, they give the other firm a share of their benefit when they adopt a high technology. And then the, the LP are the ones that adopt a low technology. They request, they ask the, um, the co-players that adopt a high technology to share their benefit. And it works in a way that everyone, no one is cheated. They all get like, they all get um, same kind of benefit at, at the end of the day after sharing it, no one is cheated. Um, with our commitment and proposing strategy, we were able to coordinate these firms to achieve to achieve this result. And then um, just the result we have from our simulation, uh, could see that when the cost of arranging such agreement is um, very little, and, um, and the competitive, um, and then the, there's the market competition is very very high, and the commitment proposing strategies they dominate. That means coordination is very very important when the market competition is high. And then if the cost of arranging such agreement is really small, we could see that um, people who want to propose such commitment deal, people who want to you know, um, do such deals. And then, but when the reverse is the case, when, um, when the competitive level of the market is not high, then there's no need for, for coordination, which means there's no need for um, adding any commitment, any agreement deal. But most of the time, like we know, the technology market is very, very, very competitive. We looked at this even in the multiplayer game and we got um, similar results. That when the cost of arranging the commitment D is very little and the market competition is very, very high, um, it's very, very beneficial for these players to coordinate within themselves using pre-commitment to, to achieve the same common goal. And then we also um, looked at when there's commitment, like we proposed, and when there's no commitment in the game, we saw that um, commitment, using pre-commitment actually improves, it, it actually uh, make have a lot of improvement, even when the cost of um, arranging the commitment deal is even a bit high. See, it's see the, the, even when the cost of arranging commitment is it's a little bit high, high, like looking at Epsilon there equals to two. We could see that there's still improvement, like if you use the pre-commitment and when there's no commitment. The, we looked at, we compared these cases in two-player game. We also compared it in the multiplayer game and we got um, similar results. In the multiplayer game, we also um, looked at a case, at a case whereby um, there's different group compositions as in how many high technology that, that needs to be um, that needs to be adopted and how many low technology? Let's say we want just a few of high technology and more of 
um, low technology, we still saw you know similar results that it's still better to coordinate you know when you want a particular number of um, technology for low, a particular number of high technology, it's still better off to coordinate these players to achieve it. And our results were still similar with the two player game and the multiplayer game. And then we, we then looked at when um, the, the, the commitment proposing strategies, does those firms that you know propose such agreement deal, if there's any time they could customize this deal, like maybe they do not want to um, have a fair share, they want to have a bigger share, you know, like from what we propose, there should be like a fair share at the end of the day. If you if you adopt a low technology, the one that adopted a high technology will share the benefits to you. But what if a case whereby um, the high and the, the, the commitment proposing strategy say no, they do not want to have a fair share, it's still very, very possible, possible in a very high competitive market. The commitment proposing strategy, they could be straight with their with their share. They could say no, we don't want to, we don't want to have any equal share, we want to have more of the benefit, want to keep more of the benefit to ourselves. And and it's it's still very possible in a very high competitive market. Whereas in a low market, in a low competitive market, they could be more generous. They could, you know, share more of their profit at just, you know, to get more commitment deals. They could decide to be more generous, and uh, our commitment proposing strategies will still work that way. So so far, we we have studied um, these results, and we've seen that uh, in a very high competitive market where um, the competition is really really high prior commitment is very, very abundant. It's very, very good to, uh, necessary to use a pre-agreement to achieve coordination. And, and then even in the multiplayer interactions where prior commitment is crucial, when there is different group composition, if for instance, they want like a different number of um, high technology and a different number of low technology, prior commitment is still very, very crucial at that level to achieve optimal coordination. Um, we're still working on it to um, get other strategies as well sorted out. Um, it's still an ongoing work. So um, is there any questions? So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I realize there's a question by Eladio Montero. OK. Hi. Uh, um... Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Um, I, I was wondering because you said that that commitment was a was a crucial uh, like tool to to increase cooperation in, in this case. But I guess in this case the interactions were just one shot, right? They they just interacted with with with, with each other just one time. Yes, yes. Because I, I will say that reputation will will increase cooperation in this case if they they know they don't abide by the by the by the commitment they made. Oh yes, we want to also study that. We want to also see um, if we do like reputation to see um, if um, that would we not have to pay for commitment deal and it will reduce the cost of commitment. We are, we are still working on that to see. Um, if it will make much difference or if it could still be the same. So it's still an ongoing work. We'll look into that as well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you so much. So at the moment, there are no further uh, questions. Thank you again, Bianca. Oh, and um, now we could uh, come to the last presentation, which is um, my presentation. And um, I will try to uh, show you my screen. Do you see my screen? Is it okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, I can see you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so my presentation is about uh, search behavior in agent-based uh, models. And um, in particular, I uh, stick to the uh, question. Um, unfortunately, my slides do not move. Ah, 
Okay, now they move. Um, I stick to the uh, question which algorithm um, should be employed to capture managerial search behavior. The background for my uh, research question is that in agent-based models, managerial search behavior usually is captured by hill climbing algorithms. But there is some empirical evidence which suggests that um, this might not be the best way to capture managerial um, decision-making uh, behavior, and that it should be rather or might be a more appropriate way to capture it by satisfying uh, behavior, which was uh, introduced by Herbert Simon. So the question that I'm addressing in particular is in how far the algorithm algorithmic representation of search behavior effects, does affect uh, affects, um, the results of agent-based models when they um, try to uh, capture complex decision problems. In order to study this question, I employ an agent-based simulation based on um, the NK uh, uh, framework, uh, which was originally uh, introduced in evolutionary biology. And um, in, on, base, on, the basic, uh, on the basis of this uh, framework, I set up um, a, a, a very fundamental organization of distributed decision-making. And um, I let my decision-makers uh, employ either a hill climbing algorithm or uh, employ a satisfying uh, algorithm, which I uh, like to propose to you in a few moments. So just to remind you what hill climbing means, it means that, um, uh, that in every time step, uh, a choice is made, which looks, uh, looks best at the moment, uh, hoping that this local optimization uh, uh, leads to the global optimal solution uh, in the end. And of course, there are very, uh, various uh, variants of the hill climbing algorithm in managerial science. Very often, uh, the steepest ascent hill climbing algorithm is uh, used, meaning that out of several options, that option which promises the highest uh, increase in outcome is uh, employed. There are various discussions about uh, and results about um, the problems of hill climbing algorithms. Um, with respect to my research, the key point is um, what, what happens if we switch in the models or do not use hill climbing anymore, but switch to satisfying uh, behavior. In order um, to study this, I just want to uh, shortly would like to introduce uh, satisfying, which was introduced um, by Herbert Simon. Uh, and it means it has, or let's put it this way, it, it has four basic components. First is um, some kind of sequential procedure, which means that a decision maker discovers a new option and before searching for a new option, the decision maker evaluates this option, whether it satisfies a certain aspiration level. If it satisfies a certain aspiration level, um, search is stopped and this option is uh, implemented. If it does not, satisfies satisfy the aspiration level as a next further option is um, searched. And in the satisfying approach, there are two dynamic adjustments uh, regarding the parameters. Um, first of all, the aspiration level might be adjusted downward, uh, downwards if the decision might maker finds it difficult to identify a satisfactory uh, alternative. And uh, second, the maximum number of options that uh, the um, decision maker is willing to explore might be increased when uh, it turns out to be difficult 
to identify satisfactory uh, options. So these are the key elements of uh, satisficing. And in order to um, contrast it uh, to the familiar hill climbing algorithms, I set up a very uh, simple agent-based model based on the NK landscape, uh, NK framework in the uh, uh, box in the bottom you see the uh, key idea of the NK framework, meaning that um, an organization in my case faces an n-dimensional binary decision problem uh, where each single choice contributes to an overall uh, performance by a certain contribution. And um, the contribution of this, uh, of a certain uh, choice, um, is not only affected by this choice, whether this choice is one or zero because it's a binary problem, but also by the choices uh, made um, with respect to K other binary choices. And this is the way how decisional complexity could, complexity could be introduced. So the level K gives the level of decisional complexity. This n-dimensional binary problem is um, decomposed into M um, partitions and each partition is a signed exclusively to one manager, or you could say to, to one decision maker within my organization. And these decision, maker, uh, de decision makers may either employ hill climbing or satisficing, all employ the same algorithm at the same time and over and for the entire simulation. And I oppose um, the, um, the results. The headquarter is interested in the overall performance resulting from this distributed uh, organization of uh, decision making. Um, just a, a brief um, up, uh, idea of uh, the parameters. The most important point, I guess, is um, uh, that we have um, different levels of intra-organizational complexity, which I tried to capture by these interaction matrices. You can see on the left-hand side um, an organization where we can decompose the overall decision problem in uh, four uh, disjoint uh, sub-problems, whereas on the right-hand side we have a higher level of inter uh, intra-organizational complexity, meaning that uh, a perfect decomposition is not uh, uh, possible. Our organizations have uh, four uh, managers, and these managers suffer from some um, uh, imprecision in ante evaluation of um, the options they found, find. So this is uh, um, this slide is on uh, the search algorithms, just um, for the satisficing algorithm as briefly introduced a few moments, moments ago. Um, I employ exponential weighting uh, in order to uh, capture the dynamic adjustments of the uh, aspiration level and the number of maximum alternative, uh, alternatives uh, searched. And regarding the hill climbing algorithms, it might be interesting for you that um, uh, I uh, impl or the results I will show you uh, next uh, employ or introduce um, results also for two hill climbing algorithms. This one, which I call uh, a HC2 strategy is the most common uh, strategy, as far as I know, in managerial science, which means that each decision maker in each time step finds two alternative options which differ each in one bit compared to the uh, status quo. So two alternatives just uh, differing in, in one bit. And then just to, to show you some kind of upper bound for, for the hill climbing in my configuration means uh, a kind of, uh, of um, or means is, is a is an, uh, configuration where uh, the managers find six alternatives in each time step, 
where uh, three alternatives differ in one bit compared to the status quo, and um, further three alternatives uh, differ in two bits compared to the status quo. So this is uh, not a familiar uh, uh, search behavior. I just show the results for this uh, hill climbing configuration uh, as a kind of uh, an upper bound. So let's come to the uh, results. Um, first of all, some baseline results for a perfectly decomposable structure and uh, um, interaction a structure with medium level of uh, complexity. And um, as you might see, uh, the um, results differ remarkably given the um, performances obtained over uh, the observation period, particularly in case of uh, medium level of complexity, we see that um, the familiar hill climbing two algorithm performs rather well, whereas um, the satisfying uh, behavior does not perform uh, that well. And um, the reason is, um, I guess, that um, in highly or more complex uh, situations um, with boundedly rational uh, agents, we have uh, um, uh, uh, numerous, numerous time delayed mutual adjustments, um, which uh, are performed by our decision makers in order to keep up uh, with the fellow managers' choices, which again induces mutual adjustments and um, uh, narrow search spaces as provided by the hill climbing two algorithm stabilize search, whereas uh, the more flexible. Um, so, uh, algorithms like my uh, uh, this this extreme hill climbing six, but also the satisfying are uh, more vulnerable to this kind of destabilization. Uh, if we stick to um, some kind of sensitivity analysis, where I um, uh, analyze or where run simulations for several levels of intra-organizational complexity, not only zero as for the case of perfect decomposability and three as for the uh, slides I've shown uh, just before, but for uh, very, uh, um, more levels of um, intra-organizational complexity, you can see that the satisfying um, algorithm reacts much more sensitive towards intra-organizational inter complexity than this green one, this hill climbing two algorithm, which is the one familiar in uh, or commonly used in managerial science. This shows up for the performance measure of final performance um, obtained, but it also shows up if I stick to another um, to another performance measure, meaning the frequency of global maximum find found. You see that the green line, the um, hill climbing to the common in managerial science is rather robust against uh, intra-organizational complexity, where, while the other um, search behaviors are rather, uh, let's say, or more sensitive. The same shows up if I stick to the question of how many alterations are made. Uh, you can see more or less uh, the same uh, pattern. So this brings me to the uh, conclusion. Uh, of uh, key findings. Um, first of all, what I wanted uh, to show with my slides is uh, that satisfying behavior seems to be much more sensitive to intra-organizational complexity than more restrictive forms of search, particularly uh, the commonly employed hill climbing two algorithm. And this brings me to some kind of, of um, how to say, uh, conclusion from, from that. It might be um, worth 
thinking about um, uh, results of agent-based models, which uh, focus on intra-organizational complexity. And in particular, it might be worth revisiting uh, the results with respect to managerial research behavior. In particular, it might be interesting to study whether results hold if I um, let decision makers operate with satisfying keeping in mind that this was found in empirical studies to be more uh, realistic than uh, hill, climb uh, hill climbing behavior. And this is, of course, which uh, might be interesting for the next uh, research, uh, research, research steps to compare the results obtained by different um, search behaviors um, in uh, or, um, organizational settings and especially revisiting uh, prior uh, models. So this was it from my side. Thank you very much uh, for listening. And I will stop sharing my screen now. And I'm open for, for questions if you wish. Um, so there's one question, I guess, in the, um, chat. Yes. Um, it's about the low performance of the HC6, uh, which is counterintuitive, um, because it looks quite stable, which makes me hard to understand the hyper activity uh, argument. Um, yes, you're you're right. It, it might be a bit uh, counterintuitive. Um, if we uh, um, think about the case of the uh, perfectly decomposable structure, you, you um, might have seen that the HC6 uh, um, um, uh, algorithm goes very uh, quickly up to nearly uh, the optimum solution. This is, uh, can I guess this can be easily under, understood because this uh, uh, search behavior provides a manager high flexibility, identifying rather fastly the, um, the uh, local optimum of of their own uh, decision problem, their small own partition. But in case that there are um, interactions, interdependencies with respect to the other managers' partitions, due to the mm -hmm. time delay we have, um, manager A reacts to what manager B did in the previous uh, period. And uh, C does the same and D also. They react to each other because they are not able to perfectly uh, anticipate what their fellow managers will do. And this leads in for levels of high complexity, regardless of the search algorithm leads to frequent mutual adjustments. And now the, the, um, the type of search behavior comes in. When we employ a search algorithm, which grants our decision makers high flexibility, meaning many options and uh, um, then many options with uh, and uh, many different options, um, then th they, they have a, a greater scope of this di uh, discretion, which induces again, or a greater scope of discretion, which induces again more um, frequent adjustments. So this is a kind of a, um, a spiral to uh, destabili uh, or a way to destabilization. And the HC2, the hill climbing 2 algorithm, which is much more restrictive, stabilizes search. And the, um, the uh, satisfying approach 
this mm -hmm. way is able to adjust or it, it means some kind of adjustment, uh, meaning that the aspiration levels as well as um, the, uh, the, the number of options search, they, they uh, in, in a way they, they, they breathe, they, they adjust to what happens before. And so the adjustment, uh, excuse me, the, the satisfactory, the satis uh, satisfying approach is, is in between. Um, maybe this, 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 this helps. Um, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, and then uh, another question, is the performance affected by the length of the simulation? Um, um, yes, you are right, I, uh, um, um, if I, um, uh, go with a satisfying uh, further than the satisfying um, uh, find some uh, kind of of, um, um, of how to say equilibrium or it, it it moves up to the to the level of the HC2 uh, so it, it depends on the level of uh, of complexity and of um, uh, all the other parameters I, I introduced meaning for example the level of uh, imprecision of my uh, managers ex ante evaluations and um, how I if, uh, how I set the adjustment of um, of the the uh, aspiration levels and um, the uh, um, maximum options found. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. So further. There is question. also a raised hand from Merla Diamontero. Hi. Um, so, uh, so, so you are the host, do you have a question or are you no, ending this? Uh, yes, uh, is it a question from the previous? Uh... No, I realize I, I had my, my hand uh, up since the... Okay, so it was from the previous uh, presentation. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. So I guess at the moment there are no further questions. Um, thank you so very much. Um, I guess we are nearly in time, and um, I think this this was our first uh, session on game theory. Hope to th see you in the uh, next sessions on game theory. And um, uh, so, thank you so much. And I guess we uh, will end the session now. Uh, Zutiria, do I have to do anything now? No, thank you for managing the, the session. Uh, we will close this room and we will open again at uh, 16.30, 10 minutes before the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you for your help. Thank you to all of you. See you again. Thank you.